So our topic um, for this 25 minutes or so now this afternoon before a Q&A is how do we share our hope in a world of brokenness? The subtitle I've been asked to speak on is The Men's Mental Health Pandemic and Sharing the Gospel. So that's where we're focusing uh, just now. Keep Ephesians 2 open now because we're going to work through quite quickly to 9 and 10. Um, but I want to contextualize 9 and 10 by, by just going through those first 10 verses briefly again. There's some headings to follow so it gives you some order and shape as I'm moving it along. The first thing, and we've heard it loud and clear this morning from Rico, is that we've got to be entirely realistic about the human condition if we're to begin to deal and diagnose and offer a prognosis and a cure for the human condition. Clearly, it's a theological starting point, first and foremost, not a psychological one. So the human condition is outlined in verses 1 to 3 of Ephesians 2 by the Apostle. As for you, you were dead in trespasses and sins. Well, that means you're in a mess, right? <laughs> Big mess, you're dead. Uh, you're in trouble. And so you should realize it. In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the, the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. The consequence of the human condition is hell. That's what's coming our way. And so I think as Christians, we've got to be careful, polite and respectful and wise about what we do and don't know about any condition in being bold on the theological premise that our lives are ruined, for they are. That's how God views the world. They're the lenses we heard of this morning. Well, if there's a realism there, before we start working out how it looks for the gospel to address this and deal with it, read with me again through the second heading I've got on the screen for you, The Great Rescue, Ephesians 2, 4 to 7. But, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. The fundamental, the pivotal, the, the axiomatic way that we deal with any perspective on our mental well-being is to first of all look at our spiritual well-being and the key the core of spiritual well-being is to be rescued by grace to be saved by grace through faith from being dead in sin this is to enter incomparable riches for eternity now, I can't possibly go to the, the question about the mental health pandemic and the limited capacity I have to, dis, to discuss it with you without contextualizing the great diagnosis, the, the biblical diagnosis and cure to the human condition. Now, let's go to the third point of five, by the way, so that you can count them down uh, after lunch. I've called this personal worth is received, not achieved. We're reading Ephesians 2, 8 to 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Stick with me in this, uh, gents, uh, straight after lunch here. Let, let's keep our eyes on this and see what we make of it. These verses are plain that it is absolutely futile for any of us to think that we can achieve anything that makes God accept us. Now, again, we've heard that from Rico this morning. It's fundamental to the Christian message, but I want to try and drive that home for a moment. Forgive me for this if you're not sporty. It's the world I know best, and I didn't give examples this morning deliberately, but my examples for these few minutes now are sports people because the world I live in. But I think it might work. Let, just try. Try with me. Here's how it works if you're an elite athlete, particularly in a team. 
Let's say you play Saturday, Saturday. You play this Saturday, you have a shocker. You have a real shocker. You're a professional athlete, you're bad. Here's what's expected of you. Go home, shut your mouth, say nothing in the changing room. Don't you dare smile, laugh, show any facial expression. Get out of here, get out of my sight. Come to work on Monday. Don't let me see you smile on Monday. Don't you be laughing at work. You keep your head down all week. Maybe we can start to have a bit of a laugh on Thursday when we're getting ready for Saturday's game. And by then, if you're playing after your rubbish performance, uh, the coach starts to talk to you. You're all right, you're inside, but everybody knows you better turn it on on Saturday, son. Or that's going to go into two weeks and it doesn't go much longer than that because you're going to be dropped. Your whole life is predicated, you don't know it, it's totally predicated on achievement, it's totally predicated, you're a cultural achiever, you're an elite athlete. The world judges you by your performance, the coach definitely needs to judge you by your performance, and so since you were an eight-year-old kid, being better than everybody at school, then in your village, then in your town, then in your city, then in your country, since you were a kid, all you know, you have no other way of being other than to be an achiever. Cutting the deals. Now, this can apply to intellectual ability, it can apply to looks, it can apply to music or the arts, it can apply anywhere. In fact, it does apply everywhere. But in some parts of society, obviously, it's more abrupt. And that is the big cultural ticket items, you know, where people know about you, even if it's only in your city because of the sport. <coughs> if you tell somebody the gospel who lives like this, they don't really hear you. They don't really hear you until the Holy Spirit opens their ears up. But even when their ears are opened, you can do a massive disservice to their Christian advancement and development, a, an enormous disservice to it, because as baby Christians, they may get that you have to come back to God, you have to repent, you have to turn around. But their capacity to begin to understand that you can't achieve anything with God is absolutely zero. Zero. Everything in their lives is about achievement with God. And so this is what happens to them. If they lose on Saturday, God sort of becomes, without them knowing it, the horrible coach. Here's what happens. They make a mistake. They sin on Tuesday and they lose on Saturday or they play badly. You may laugh at this. You may think this is ridiculous. They have a mayor on Saturday and they did something they shouldn't have done on Tuesday. Now, there's plenty of times when you do something you shouldn't do, so it's pretty easy to be caught out by Satan being feeling guilty for something you shouldn't have done, right? And condemned for it. Here's what then happens. They go into the game on Saturday and they have a bad game and they think, I've had it a thousand times this conversation, I let God down, I let God down on Tuesday. I did something I shouldn't have done. And that was why Saturday happened. And any reasonable Christian would say, don't be ridiculous. The gospel doesn't work like that. But in the history of faith and sport, one thing has stood out, which has been the great redeemer for people who are caught in that trap and they feel God's judging them and they're guilty and they can't achieve enough. Here's the brilliant answer. I grew up with it in the 80s. Get the famous athlete to give their testimony to the whole world because what greater thing could a man do than tell everybody about the Lord Jesus Christ when he's been a Christian three minutes? He knows nothing, has no understanding of the gospel, no depth of life, no great fellowship, probably isn't in a church, but he earns the right with God. And I'm telling you now, I've known so many people who fall away from faith because five years into being a Christian or 10 years or definitely when they retire because nobody ever wants to talk to them again in the public arena or a fraction do. Do you know what they've confused? God is the great coach in the sky. I keep turning back to him, but I'm forever feeling guilty because I never quite achieve enough for him. And even when I try and give my testimony in public, it still doesn't seem quite enough to give me joy and fulfillment, because I always feel bad before God. Ephesians 2, 8 to 9, forgive me for doing it with sport, it's all I really know. Do it in your own world if you can, and I'm sorry if I'm not a good translator of that this morning. Your identity, said Rico, can never be in your performance. But our identities love being in our performance. Because I'm bringing something to the table. 
and it's spiritually crippling. Acceptance can never be contingent on performance. We don't live for approval. We heard this morning, we live from approval, from approval. Or, this is what I'll say to athletes all the time, the verdict with Jesus Christ always comes before the performance. For the whole world, the verdict comes after the performance. The gospel says the verdict always comes before the performance. It is by grace you have been saved through faith, not from yourselves, not from works. It's the gift of God. The most glorious aspect of the gospel is God's love for the unworthy. And the consequence of grasping this is singularly the most important thing a Christian man can do in order to get what we might call a sense of mental well-being in this world today. I am loved whether I'm king of the world in my opinion or lower than a snake's belly. I am loved the same. Jesus thinks of me the same whether I'm achieving brilliant things in my own opinion and others or failing entirely. I might say to some older men in here, Jesus loves you the same, whether your children are all converted and flying with Jesus or none of them are. But we can't believe it. I'm a failure. It's a tragic attack of hell upon us. That if we want to start talking about our health, we must start here. This is the gospel. It is knowing this truth alone that can inspire grateful, joyous human hearts that love Jesus. Nobody loves me when they know what I'm really like. Nobody could possibly really, really trust me, we heard this morning, if they really saw inside me. But he entrusts me with his love. Now, there's just one more section, but it's got a couple of headings with it, right? And I'm going to try my best here to separate out divine vocation. Thanks for being patient with me. I'm trying this on you. Look with me at verse 10, because here's a most wonderful thing for a sense of purpose and meaning in life in the light of free grace. Verse 10. Verse 8 and 9. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not from yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Gents, here's the most magnificent reformed teaching, as far as I can understand it, on the heart of the gospel. The combination of two things. I am completely accepted regardless of any achievements or failures by the new covenant. I'm entirely loved. The judgment always has come before the performance that I am clean and saved and my book is empty of the, in God's eyes. I'm clean before him when he looks at the book of me. Jesus has achieved that. So what? And the gospel won't let us forget the second part, which is always built upon the first and always contingent on it, but entirely congruous with it. And it's verse 10. It's the same God of absolute and unconditional love who gave his life at Calvary so that my sins might be forgiven and hell escaped and heaven my, my life. It is the same God who knew you in your mother's womb and gave you the looks, the brains, the talent, the background, who gave you the family you have, who put you in the home that you live in. This is what we touched on with Daniel this morning. Here's the continuity. God doesn't make mistakes. He is in charge of everything. Impossible to grasp, but important to believe in hope and faith. Because I put it to you, 
that the greatest motivation in the universe for saying to God Almighty, Lord, I want to give everything I have for you. I want my life to be yours. I would love to achieve whatever I can with my wife, my children, my best friends, my neighbors, my family, my workmates, the hobbies. I want to be different class at it, Lord. But Father, I know the secret to not feeling burdened by my failures in my efforts in life or full of hubris in my success is to know that you know all about me and you love me unconditionally and it is the very same God who says to me, right, Daniels, go and have a crack at life, son. Go on. I've given you any talents you've got, any relationships you've got. I gave them to you. Come on, you and me. Let's go. I will never judge you, my child, by how well you do or how badly you do. And with that in mind, I think it's absolutely clear what the gospel promises us. Liberation. Freedom to live. A sense of fulfillment that Jesus loves me regardless of the nonsense of my failures. And he loves me regardless of my ability to achieve anything. God is not served by human hands as if he needed anything, for he gave everyone life and breath and everything else. <laughs> he doesn't need anything from me. So you know what the gospel should do in terms of our well-being? It should liberate us to say, right, I'll find things that I've never been able to say, just in case you can say them. Right, I'm a good-looking man. Right, I'm really clever. Right, I'm great at music. Right, people understand me when I speak. I mean, it could be anything. But the liberation now is that these were God's handiwork. Look at the line, verse 10. God's handiwork. That's who I am. And I was created in Christ Jesus to do good works. This is the key Reformation distinction. I'm not saved by good works. My salvation is entirely undeserved. But there are no things that I'm free to go do. Like be a dad. In my case, like be a husband. Like be a mate. Like be somebody at a football club. Like be the guy sitting with somebody in a taxi when the conversation runs dry. Come on, Lord, you put me here. Let me have a go at it. The Reformers were brilliant on this. Martin Luther, for example, talks about, you know, when he gets out of the monastery and he stops thinking the only way you can ever please God is getting into the monastery and being on your own and saying your prayers with nobody around you and not engaging with the world. When he flew out of that monastery and off he went, he started talking about 24-7 behaviors. He didn't call it that. He started talking about the wholeness of being a Christian. And he tells stories, uh, a range of stories. I'm picking, I'm picking something out here for you now. Uh, he talks about, for example, if you were a baker, if you made your living as a baker. God does three things in this way for the baker. Number one, if the baker's not converted, there's common grace. The sun shines and the rain falls on the just and the unjust. God restrains sin in the world by giving you people around you and a job. The baker... Christian or not, would find himself needing to treat his customers properly or they wouldn't buy his bread. And his suppliers properly or they wouldn't sell him. And Luther says, this is the wonder of the fact that we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper or spiritual act of worship, Romans 12 verse 1. The wonder of this is, wherever people are, God will restrain sin by common grace, through the need to make a living, to raise your children. And then he goes one step further, and he says, for the Christian who knows the wonder of free grace through the gospel of Jesus Christ, their family, friends, job, means of making a living, becomes a place where the trouble and toil that inevitably comes your way, aka, missing a plane because it was stalled 
and not being able to get there and making a decision to say, right, Lord, you've got my life. You're in charge of all this. I was here on time. It's all gone pear-shaped. What do you want to do with this? You love me. You know all about me. Here's where I am. Right, this is trouble and toil. But you put me here. How can I serve you now, Lord? Because I can't earn your freedom. I can't earn your forgiveness. What do you want me to do? Now, this is purpose and meaning and hope in all situations. Even in the worst situations, there's a purpose that God put you there for right now. If you want to be well, if you want a, a whole perspective on life, if you want a depth for life, accept the free gift of grace, never earned, never achieved, never lost, never won, ever again. Verdict before performance and then say, no, you are the very one who gave me all my talents and relationships. Highs and lows, help me love worshiping you with every moment of my life. This is the Christian life in good balance and well-being. Uh, there's a Reformation scholar, a specialist on, on Cranmer called Ashley Null, uh, N-U-L-L. Null uh, loves Cranmer and, and writes about the Reformation, but uh, he, he loves writing about sport. It's quite weird. And he wrote a paper. Uh, he's the only one I know like it. He wrote a paper on two Olympic athletes, a 2016 paper. They competed against each other. They were both the top people, so it was silver or gold between them, and they were both believers, and he was meeting them before a major international event to pray with them. That's tricky, isn't it? He says he'd said to athletes all the way, all the way along, listen, uh, God's in charge of your life. He won't waste a second of it. You never know in sport if today's going to be Good Friday, Easter Sunday. We simply cannot tell before a competition. What I know is this, God won't waste a second of it. Whether it's Good Friday for you today or Easter Sunday, he won't waste a second of it. Can you believe that? He says to them, can you believe that? He won't love you less if you lose and he won't love you more if you win. You don't win because he loves you more because you were good and you don't lose because you were worse. None of it's the case. It's free. Your grace is free. You're saved. You're free. He made you a swimmer. Right. Whichever it is, he's not going to waste a second of it. And here's three questions that he used. And, and really, this is a nice synopsis, I think, of the Luther come Calvin position, which we'll round off to in a minute. And, and sorry for doing the sport. Now, ask, ask this question now about your wife, your children, your mum or dad, your job, your neighbours, your hobbies. Ask these three questions. Because this is the good works prepared in advance for us to do. This is being the handiwork of God, being redeemed and rescued by Christ. Here they are. How has God's gift enabled you to experience joy. Look back now at your relationships, your most intimate ones. Look back at the vocation and work, the work you've been given to do. And I bet now, for most of us, we can look back and say, oh, what wonderful moments I've had because of where God's put me in life. Here's the key balancing act. Let's go to the second question. How have God's gifts drawn you closer to him in adversity? when you've wept privately and when it's all gone so badly wrong, when you wonder how it's all crumbled this way, how did I get into this place? He used it with athletes, of course, when they lose. Here's the profundity of it. If God's in charge of the universe, if he's the sovereign Lord of all creation, if he knew us in our mother's womb, if we're God's handiwork knit together, if he gave you the people and the places that you're in, the way to sustain balance and equilibrium in Christ is to know that the gift of grace means acceptance that is absolute and never contingent on performance. And it is also and continuous and part of the outworking of it, according to the reformers from Ephesians 2.10, to say, you put me here now and I'm going to have some amazing joy and I'm going to have some terrible adversity. What do you want to teach me in it, Lord? Gentlemen, this may be painful today, but we can all look back right now immediately at things that were so devastating in our lives. We can all do it and we look back and the scar, you just touch it and the tissue is so tender, it's agony, even today, right? Even if it was a decade ago. And yet, how many of us would say, if I could erase that from history, I would erase it this second. But what I would never erase is what God has taught me through it. Isn't it? What a weird thing that is, isn't it? 
God, if that had never happened, it would be magnificent. I wish I could go back in time. And yet, I learned so much about you. You were the only one I could run to. You were my only hope in that terrible moment. And I could barely even talk to you, but you were there. And I look back now and I see how powerful your presence was as I rebelled and raged and feared life itself. And if you can get those two questions clear in your mind, the Lutheran approach is you now understand God's school of discipleship. Because where is a man to learn to be a disciple of Jesus other than in those places in the world where he knows people really, really intimately and they know him? And where he is gifted and talented and he can feel that he is an achiever in that world? That's my lamb. So they're the three questions to bear in mind. I'm going to highlight very quickly two things that result from this. And I'm, I'm going to highlight them. Here we go. Grace and gratitude. This is a great cry of the Reformation. Grace and gratitude, isn't it? I'm saved by faith. I can't earn it. I can't lose it. It's a gift. I can't achieve it. It'll never change. The gratitude, isn't it, is overwhelming. How does the gratitude show itself? What can I do around me? How can I serve around me? How can I be your man around me? Because we've got something left to give other people. Because God's gift has drawn us closer to others in his service. The third question. When you're not consumed with your own achievements because you're loved regardless, you are free to give away instead of surviving. I say to athletes, Mate, you've got two options in life. When you're terrified in the middle of a big match, here's what you've got to do. You've got to look up if the ball goes dead and you've got to say, I'm scared, I'm really scared, I'm scared. And you've got to ask yourself, am I safe or scared? Am I safe or scared? Am I loved whether I'm champion today or the biggest loser? Am I safe or scared? And say to yourself, I'm safe with Christ. I'm safe with Christ. If you're scared, you will certainly survive by the best ways you can, by looking horizontally. Fight or flight or freeze, you'll survive. When you know you're safe, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, you can serve with the good works that God has given you. And you can be better class of bloke. Better at being normal. Time on the ball, dare I use that metaphor, to love other people. Grace leads to gratitude, leads to authenticity. You're a bigot, Rico said. Remember? What do we say to you're a bigot? Of course, I worked it out afterwards, as you all did, what to say. Here's what I'm saying, and he said it really. Mate, you don't know me then. Because if you knew me, that was his answer really, wasn't it? Because he knew people in the street. If you knew me, oh, listen, I'm the biggest loser ever. If you could see in my heart, I'm the worst person you ever met. But if you knew me with Jesus in me, you wouldn't be able to say that to me. Because Jesus has changed me because he loves me regardless of my stupidity. And he's given me some abilities in life and I just use them and somehow he, he gives me more love for others than I ever had without him. So you, you and me need to talk because you and me don't know each other. Because Jesus changed me. This is the gospel. Let me read you the final paragraph. Christian athletes, Christians can appreciate that the value of the commitment, effort, investment required to achieve and sustain a career does not ultimately depend on any specific result or the career record. Rather, the worth of a person's performance and endeavor is discerned by God's faithfulness in using every aspect, performance, victory, success, failure, defeat, for God's more significant eternal purposes and glory in your life. The clarity in comprehending that God will be faithful to his commitment to using the gifts he has granted an athlete for good allows the Christian man to appreciate the joys and disappointments of their lives, families, and careers. When they face the anguish of losing some of their deepest held aspirations, their confidence in the divine goodness, love and plan for their lives is pivotal to retaining equilibrium. 
This is the gospel. This is the source of well-being and health. This is what we teach. And this is a privilege beyond imagination that he won't waste a moment of my life in all the highs and the lows and I'll have something to give away. God, may it be true for us. Amen. Trevor.